Welcome back to 12Y Data Visualization in the Social Sciences. This short lecture reviews how and why we use computer simulations to look at the different kinds of distributions that we might observe in different forms of data. The reason that we use a simulation is that a computer lets us generate random numbers and create hypothetical data with characteristics that we choose. Whenever we're examining real data that's collected out there in the world, <clears throat> we're often working backwards. We have the data that resulted from some process, and then we're trying to examine what that process might have been by looking at the data that comes out at the end. Simulation lets us work in the other way. Using a computer to create hypothetical data, we can decide what the process is and what it looks like that creates the data, and then take a look at that hypothetical data at the end. So when we get to control the process that creates the data, we're basically creating our own little hypothetical world. And then we can train ourselves to understand what do the data look like when the world works this way versus that way. Then when we see those kinds of data out there in the world that were created by a real process, then we can understand if a distribution looks a particular way, it might be because the process that created it is similar to some hypothetical process that we created in a simulation. So simulation is a tool for understanding what do data look like when they were created under different circumstances that we're able to control. There are a few different distribution types that are really common in the data that we often examine with continuous outcome variables. One is called a uniform distribution. Uniform meaning the same all the way across. So if we were to roll one die, a six-sided cube, and then we were to look at how commonly does each number come up the more and more times that we roll the die, each one of those six numbers is going to be equally common. So using the program See It, developed by the statisticians at UC Davis for this week's activity, this will be an example that you'll look at. This little distribution here, it's even all the way across. So if we can kind of draw a straight line that roughly goes through all the columns in a histogram, that's how we can learn to recognize a uniform distribution. What's an example of a situation that might create a uniform distribution? Other than rolling a six-sided die, imagine if students' test scores on an exam were completely random between 0 and 100. So if we're looking at this histogram, which summarizes the distribution of students' test scores in a hypothetical class, the heights of each of these columns tells us the number of students that got a score in those bins that are 10 points wide. And we can roughly draw a straight line through all of the bins. Some are a little taller, some are a little shorter. That's how it works when you've got random numbers. But in general, the distribution of scores is equal all the way across. So some students do really well getting above a 90, some students do really poorly getting below a 10, and the most probable scores are just evenly distributed. So every score is equally probable, and the average score for a uniform distribution would be right in the middle. So if I were to see a distribution of test scores for a class that looked like this, it would be my cue that students are equally likely to do really well as they are to do really poorly. And so something's not going right in my class if students are just as likely to get an A as they are to get an F. So a uniform distribution means that there's equal probability all the way across, across all the different values. Another common distribution that we see is called the normal distribution. It's so common that we actually call it the normal distribution. And normal is a bell-shaped curve, so it kind of goes like this, like a bell-shaped would, if you were to imagine the shape of a bell. And it's got a peak right there in the middle. In the example for this week's Try It, you'll simulate what a normal distribution looks like by rolling two dice. So you're rolling one six-sided die and you're rolling another one and then you're adding the numbers together. So the smallest value you can get is a one and a one added together is two. The largest value you can get is a six and a six added together, which equals 12. The most common possible combination is a seven. 
So you can roll a 1 and a 6, a 2 and a 5, a 3 and a 4, and then the reverse for each one of those. So there are a lot of different combinations that can result in a 7. That's why 7 is the most probable outcome when you're rolling two dice. And a normal distribution is something that we see come up a lot in nature, like it's people's heights or if it's distances um, that kind of fruits or seeds travel from a tree. And in a normal distribution, a situation that might create it is that there's a most typical or probable value for our continuous outcome variable. And then at random, sometimes the values are a little higher or a little lower, but it's pretty improbable that people get really far from that middle value. If I'm looking at an example in the test scores example, and I'm simulating what would a normal distribution of test scores look like, this histogram would look like this. So in this particular example, the average score, it's always right in the middle of a normal distribution. So the average score is somewhere around an 83 in this distribution. Most of the scores are a little bit above or below the average, so the majority of the students in this hypothetical example all got right there in the B range between an 80 and a 90. And then there's a little bit less probability of students getting above or below something like a 90 or something well below the low 70s, mid to low 70s. So the typical student is right there in the middle of the distribution. Most of the scores are kind of close to it, a little above or a little below. And then there are just a handful of scores that are well above or well below the average, but they tend to clump together. And if I see a normal distribution like this, what it tells me is that the students on average are getting most of the material right. They're getting somewhere in that B range. Some students get a little bit higher, some students get a little bit lower. Another distribution that you might see in the real world is called a bimodal distribution. Remember that a mode is a most common value. So we would refer to a bimodal distribution as having two modes or two humps in the data. And in the example for this week, for the try it in the lab quiz data, what you'll examine are data on political attitudes based on whether somebody's in the Democratic or Republican political parties. And the Democratic and Republican parties tend to think very differently from each other. So all of the political attitudes measured on some scale might be on one end for Democrats and it might be on the opposite end for Republicans. That's what we call polarization. Polarized means that everything is far from the center. And if we see a distribution that looks like this, it kind of looks like it's two different normal distributions, where one of them is on the low end and one of them is on the high end. And if we have two different distributions that look like this, that's our cue that maybe there are two groups in the data, that there's some predictor variable that separates people into one group versus another, and that's why we've got one distribution on one side and one distribution on the other side. And when we've got a bimodal distribution, our measures for central tendency can be a little wonky. So if you take a look at this example from see it, this is something that you'll produce for the try it and lab quiz data for this week. The mean and the median, which are measures for what is the middle or typical value in a distribution for a continuous variable, those two values are in between one group and the other in this bimodal distribution. So if we see a bimodal distribution, we should think two things. One is that the average values are going to be between the groups instead of in the middle of either group, often. And the other thing we should think is that there's probably some predictor variable that separates one group from the other. In the test score example, what if I simulated a world where half the students in the class um, got the material and the other half really struggled? And if we were to imagine an example, what if in lecture I were to give the answers to some quiz questions? And then the students that were in lecture got those answers, the students that weren't in lecture didn't get the answers. That could create two different groups that result in a bimodal distribution of test scores, where we've got one normal distribution where the most typical score is somewhere around an A, it's somewhere in the 90s. And the other distribution looks like a normal distribution where the most typical score is somewhere in the high 60s, somewhere around a D. The hidden predictor variable would be 
who came to class and got the answers that I gave to those questions. <clears throat> and the average or the median for the overall distribution of test scores would be somewhere right in between that group that got the answers and the group that didn't. It could be somewhere around a B. But that average or median score doesn't actually represent that many students. It just splits the difference between the group that got the answers and the group that didn't. And simulations let us understand what are the resulting distributions for these different scenarios. So is it a scenario where I'm maybe not good at teaching the material because students are equally likely to do really well versus really poorly? That would create a uniform distribution. Is it the scenario where most of the students really do pretty okay on the material and some do a little bit better, some do a little bit lower on the average scores? That would be a normal distribution. Is it a scenario where half of the class seems to be getting some information or material that the other half of the class doesn't? That would create a bimodal distribution. And then when I'm giving exams and I see what the distribution looks like at the end, I can examine the distribution of actual test scores and compare it against the resulting simulated distributions to understand which one of these three scenarios seems to match the outcome for the class most closely. And that's training me to understand what's going on in the classroom and how can I understand what's driving the resulting test scores that I see. The last thing that you'll use simulations to understand for the uh, Try It and Lab Quiz e exercises for this week is trying to understand sampling error. And this is something that we discussed at the end of lecture um, last Monday. Sampling error is the idea that when any time we take a random sample from a population, we're hopefully getting a nice representative picture of what's going on for that whole population. But because we've taken people at random for our samples, sometimes we're going to include a different shuffle of people, which means that the average value for whatever variable we're measuring will sometimes be a little higher and it will sometimes be a little lower, purely due to random chance. And if I were to take one random sample after another after another from the same population, and all of them have the same sample size, then every time I do that, my sample might have a slightly different average or a slightly different proportion. And what simulations let me do is understand whether or not I can predict how much that random fluctuation might happen. So if I were to take 25 random samples from a population, how much will those average values from those 25 samples be off from one another. And if they're not off by very much, that's really reassuring to me as a researcher because it means that if I were to take another random sample and look at that data again relative to the data that I'm already examining, then hopefully my answers will be pretty consistent that come from those data. And so I can do that same thing, just like I simulated a um, distribution of test scores for a single classroom, I could do that over and over and over again for 20 different classrooms. And I can treat, treat those 20 different classrooms just like there were 20 random samples of 25 students each. What I can do is simulate one class and calculate the average score. Simulate another class, calculate the average score, and do that again and again 20 times. What results is another data set, instead of it being 25 individual students though in each data set, it's a single data set where it's the average score from 20 different classes. And the thing to notice is that when I look at this distribution of 20 different averages from 20 different classes, it kind of looks like a normal distribution. It's kind of symmetric. The most typical value represented by the peak of that distribution is right there in the middle, and it looks kind of symmetric. And also, most of the average scores are pretty close to one another. If you take a look at the x-axis, which shows the values for the average test scores from each of the different classes, then the range is not nearly as big as it was for an entire classroom of students. So for a classroom of students, you might see the scores ranging from the 60s up to the 90s. But when I look at this distribution of 20 averages from 20 different classes, the distribution's pretty small. It's only going on um, the bin start at 80 up to ending at 86. And most of those scores are right there off just by a couple of points from each other.
So when I use simulations to take a bunch of different random samples and compare the averages from all of those different random samples, the thing I notice is that from one random sample to the next, the averages are a little different from each other due to that random shuffling of students, but the averages are not so different. They're not as different from each other as the individual students were from each other. And so simulations also give me that advantage of being able to understand how consistent would I expect my random samples to look from one to the next to the next without actually having to go through all of the time and effort and expense of collecting data from 20 different random samples. Instead, I can use a simulation and I can predict how consistent will my information be if I were to take different random samples of the same population.